On our earth, before writing was invented, before the printing press was invented, poetry flourished. That's why we know that poetry is like bread. It should be shared by all, by scholars and by peasants, by all our vast, incredible, extraordinary family of humanity. That was Pablo Neruda, and I'm Bob Holman, and this is the Poetry is Bread podcast, where poetry challenges us, makes us think, and with imagination and courage, changes the world. Very honored to have here in the Poe studio, Cecilia Vicuña, languages Selknam, Mapuche, Quechua Aymara, Kakan, Guarne, English, Greek, a bit of Italian, certainly Latin, Javanese, and Spanish. Kisa Alango. A word moves a bit of air says Nachman of Bratslav. God is the essence of the written letters concealed in the dust of the poet's pencil, says the Sumana Santaka. To read a text in Thai is divotak, to smash it into pieces. The yil, a song, is the only material manifestation of the invisible reality, the Mapuche say. A song melts the boundaries between the worlds, Lawrence Sullivan says. A vibratory disorder, an incantation, bends time itself. An image, too is an interference pattern, a rhythm born at the meeting point of light and eye. We don't see light, we see with the light, someone says. A word in the air lets you hear the image, see the sound. In the Andes, people say, an image hears, a sound sees. You don't put a mask to be seen, but to see with different eyes. But there's no word for beauty. A song must never strike the right tone. You say, kisa, instead. The slow power to transform. El suave endulzar de una fruta secándose al sol. A slow drying fruit. Hate and anger becoming peace and love. The spectrum at work. A color gradation is an effort of light to unite shadow and light. The rainbow has a motor, they say. To weave gradations is to weave an illusion, a destello that hits the eye. Not to mystify with illusion, but to clarify the role of illusion in our perception of reality. Alango in Java. Beauty. Is not a noun, but a god, a divine manifestation. Simultaneamente arrobado y arrobante, being in ecstasy creates the state, quizá, alango. Well, there's... Uh no noun for beautiful, so I'm not going to say that word. But I'm, I'm thinking, you know, 
your performances are so directed at the audience, so physical. I mean, I'm just going to give our listening audience just one little taste, which is that one time I was sitting next to Cecilia at a Cecilia poetry reading, and she was talking to me, and I didn't realize it, but that was the start of the performance. Next thing I knew, our conversation, which of course was multilingual, was getting a little bit louder, and she was standing up, and suddenly she was behind the audience, and they didn't know. They were still looking for somebody up front, and all of a sudden there was sound. There it was, and then there was this red thread that was coming around. Anyway, I won't go on, because I want to ask you, Cecilia, when you're, when you're doing this into a microphone with, a, with a, a spit screen or whatever they call this thing in front of us, um, you know, do, do you sense the audience? How, how does that work? Well, I think it's an animal thing. Um, the first time I found myself in front of an audience, it was 5,000 people that had gathered at the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes in Santiago. I was probably 20, 21. And I was there with my tribuno, a group that I had somehow baptized and in a way invented because uh, suddenly I decided we're the tribuno, the no tribe, because we are not a tribe. And so what are we? We are the living no. And when I found myself in front of this rowdy audience, I felt it as if it was one creature. One mm. alive creature, you know, like with the cilion heads and, you know, very, very, very chaotic. And I love that. So I began to sing to that animal. Mm. And the animal danced to do it right away. Mm. Well, I certainly can envision our audience dancing or at least getting their ear a little closer to have the words start to dance with their eustachian tube, with the uh, hammer, anvil, and stirrup, and the eardrum it beats upon, uh, as you read that incredible poem. The tribu no. Um, so in other words, what you're saying, which means no tribe, and that was the name you gave to your cadre, your uh, posse, um, back in the in the day in Chile, revol a revolutionary uh, uh, force. Um, you're telling me that your first reading was for five thousand people. Yes, that's the way it was. <laughs> and so we were invited to be part of this event. That if this was in 1970, it was the summer of 1970, and so it may have been January. I don't remember the month but I remember it was hot and so uh, it's, it's Chile so it's the southern hemisphere right, right. and it was the time of the happenings so this was conceived as a happening that would have baroque music and Mapuche music mm. and an uncle of mine that, that was a scientist who invented a machine called El Abstractoscopio Chromatico which was a machine that was perpetually creating huge abstract paintings projected on the wall. So it was also rock and roll. And um, Mapuche Trutrucas, Mapuche is Trutruca, she, it's a sort of huge uh, trumpet that is like the animal cry of um, an animal from another dimension. So it sounds like uh Woodstock with a uh, with a political depth to it. It sounds like you know. It sounds like what the '60s into the '70s were about for us, you know. And the idea that politics, revolutionary politics, and uh, and art could be on the same stage. In fact, be in the same person was just part of the crazed ambiance of of make it new that was going on at that moment. Yeah, it was really uh, poetry and life, art and politics all into one. And we experienced that, and now each time I tell any story from that period, the young people of Chile who have been born so many decades after that don't really believe that that can be true, you know, because after the military coup, all that 
completely disappeared. There was such a violent persecution of beauty, intelligence, creativity. And persecution, they, for example, targeted the balls of young boys and the vaginas of young girls, electrocuting them. Mm. And they did this to thousands and thousands of people. And so I don't think Chile has yet recovered from that, even though this year is 50 years from that military coup. And uh, so there was this extraordinary moment, the beginning of your poetry, quote, career, unquote, perhaps. And uh, what happened next? Well, a huge censorship came on towards me and to towards uh, people such as me. And so, for example, just before leaving Chile, I left Chile at the end of 1972 with a grant to study in London, to study art in London. So when I left Chile, I remember um, I was still in Santiago in my bedroom, my teenage bedroom, and suddenly there was a knock on the door, and it was my mother disguised as a journalist. And she said, um, um, I am here to interview you to see how you feel about living for London. And she had uh, a recorder in her hand to oh, record wow. me. And when my mother did that performative act a few minutes before we left for the airport, for me it was like the sky and the heavens opened up and I saw a different reality and I felt as if a huge earthquake had taken place and the whole reality that I knew as Chile had disappeared. And I remember at the time, this was so long ago, that an airplane that left Chile first had to land in Buenos Aires and then had to land in Dakar in Africa to refuel. And when I saw that that Chile that I had known was going to be gone, I arrived in Africa, still crying. I cried and cried, sensing that a terrible pain was forthcoming, and it was. The, the wow. coup was a year the, after that. Wow. So your upbringing, am I right that I read someplace that uh, you say your heritage is both indigenous, and I'd like to know what that means to you indigenous but also basque is is the which of course is the uh the the language of the of the pyrenees that is a, a language isolate no language is connected with it such an unusual culture to be mixed but it is that true yes it is literally true in my blood for example the uh, the basque are also the people where uh, is the only people that I know of where the RH negative group is predominant. And that is true of my family and is true of me. I am RH negative. So it's undeniable. Plus I did my DNA. And the Basques, of course, like everybody else, came from Africa, but via Ireland. So my genetic um, trajectory passes through Ireland, so I consider myself Irish Basque on my father line. Wow. But on the indigenous side, it's a very good question, what does that mean? Because my mother never knew that she was indigenous, nor did my grandma. And But when I did my DNA, the DNA traced our family trajectory from Africa, Siberia, to the north of Chile. And this makes a lot of sense because my great-grandmothers were all born in the north of Chile. And they carried the name of one of the conquerors. And it was typical that the conquerors who raped, let's say, 1,000 women, all those 1,000 women would carry his name. So certain names are prevalent <laughs> in certain <laughs> areas because of the fucking of these monsters, you know. Yeah. But um, it, it is a language, the Tiakita, it is a language that was, uh, and it's still regarded as extinguished, even mm. though the Tiakita people were not extinguished, mm. they they mixed. And mm-hmm. so uh, I think 
uh, of these people as my most, uh, let's say, uh, or, or my closest relatives from a past going back two or three centuries. But the language did not reach me. And I suppose that that's the reason why I sing in unknown languages, because I feel those languages in me as I don't, I don't create them, I hear them. Mm. And what comes out of my mouth is the longing for those sounds, those funny conversations that I hear in a language that we don't know. Just sort of stopped here. Oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the Arte Precario installation uh, that you did. I'm going to s- just skip around a little bit. We are going to leave you on the way from Dakar to London uh, chronologically. But art, as far as your art goes, I, I would like to, to first pick up on what you said by talking about these installations which you did and I believe what was this in Chile where you were doing yes doing the uh, the Arte Precario you did them in the streets in nature in nature's city streets you created uh, you said as listening to an ancient silence longing to be heard yeah that is true you know um so what did it mean for me to be indigenous? I decided that I was indigenous when I was uh, old enough to read in my father's library, and um, which was maybe when I was three or four years old. And um, my father called me my little Eskimo. Mm. And if you look at the pictures of Cecilia, I really looked Eskimo. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me a little book that was called like that. And I could see the drawing in the book and I could see myself and I certainly looked that way. And then I saw Seltnam Girl one day in a book. I was probably eight years old or seven years old at the time, super young. And I could see that she looked exactly like me. So I had decided that also when we were taken to the cinema to see cowboy films, I could never side with the cowboys. You see. So, <laughs> so my way was completely sort of oblique and through my heart, not through my knowledge. So you mentioned Selknam, uh, which in the in the movie that I made, the little movie, it was 50 different languages in a 15-minute poem film. You, uh, you speak Selknam, which I've always uh, listed as uh, as a language, they call it sleeping now, but extinct is, is what we were using at the time, where you say, orishin, orishin, yi pen, yi pen. Um, so Selknam is from the south of Chile, am I right? Or, yeah, from, yeah, from Tierra del Fuego. It's a wonderful, extraordinary story of the Selknam people that they arrived walking in this island when the island was still connected to the continent. And then the Magallanes Strait came up, huge mm. <laughs> strait, you know, huge bunch of the very wild sea, and they were isolated. So they lived for 8,000 years in complete isolation. So they developed this extraordinary metaphysical universe of poetry and creativity. And then, of course, the white people arrived and they killed them like if they were not human beings. It was really monstrous. And I remember I was a teenager when it was published in the newspaper that the last Selman had died. And so I grew up believing that they had gone extinct, but still some of their poetry had been collected, and I heard that poetry. And that's how I heard the voice of the women shamans saying those words. And I began to sing them in homage to those last women singers. But all that has changed because the grand, grand, grandchildren of the people that were determined to be extinguished by the white people colonizers are saying we are not extinct we are alive Mm -hmm. and we're bringing now back the language and i have met them and it's really extraordinary to see women self poets now singing and 
chanting again in the language that is coming back. That's so exciting. That's exactly, you know, the, I mean, we have laws to protect endangered species of plants and animals, but who's there to protect the languages? But now it seems that the people themselves of this culture realize their identity is within the words, within the languages. And when we were doing, when we were putting together that film, you told me that the last speaker that was known was named uh, Lola Kiepya. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah, you said it yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. And I just want to turn her name in because part of the orality is to keep these names alive, is mm -hmm. to mention to who who done it and who did it. You know, the same time that this, the Silk Nam was going on in Tierra del Fuego, there was also a culture that this has just recently uh, been discovered, uncovered, um, which is called the Carl Supe, which is was up north. And uh, am I right? This is in I, Peru. In Peru, yeah. And yeah. they supposedly they were unique in that they had no art, but they had kipas. Kipu. Kipu. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the kipu that was found in Caral is um, the, it has been dated in 5,000 years ago. So that would make kipu even older than written language as evolved in Mesopotamia. And to me, this is the most wonderful thing in the world because if, if a kipu was found in Caral, already, you know, composed as a kipu, it means it evolved slowly from way back before that, you know, you can't come up with a kipu from one minute to the next. It's a very complex uh, concept. You know. So I guess it's time to let uh, many of the people in the audience in on what uh, kipu is, in that it, such a historical artifact is used in the extraordinary contemporary work of one Cecilia Vicuña. Yeah, kipu means not in Quechua, and the Quechua people are a later people in the Andes, and uh, somehow they inherited the, the tradition of tying knots that pre-existed um, the uh, Inca culture uh, by a few thousand years, the Wari people 2,000 years before, and had already uh, evolved kipu to a very complex uh, condition. And it means that you en encode information in the form of knots. Instead of writing, you write with knots. And the knots can carry as much meaning as alphabetic writing as it has been studied. Because um, the colors, the shape of the knot, whether it's spun to the right or to the left, the position of the knot, how many turns the knot has, all of it carries as many iterations as alphabetic writing. So it's a very complex system of information, plus it's tactile. And it has uh, also a metaphysical dimension in that kipu was not just an object as you find in Wikipedia to keep count. Yes, you can also keep count. It also kept stories, but it also represents an umbilical connection with the cosmos. And this was manifested in ritual systems of ceremonies that existed. And to me, that is the most uh, amazing legacy of the kipu, not the object, but the fact that it exists in so many dimensions. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And of course, whoops, I'm not allowed to say beautiful. Anymore. <laughs> or maybe I should just say orshin, orshin. Which means beautiful, beautiful. And then yepen, yepen, which means disgusting, awful. <laughs> <laughs> both, both. <laughs> True poetry, yeah, containing both. Yes, so, uh, so let's just skip right ahead here with the kipus. You just had a, um, a show at the Tate uh, in, in London where you your kipus were, were set free to have the meanings as people walked amongst them. Yeah. Yeah, the, the truth of the matter is that when I was growing up, 
and nobody even spoke about Kipu. It was so forgotten that only a handful of archaeologists and scholars knew about it. And somehow the teenage Cecilia uh, found a Kipu in a book and my impression is that Kipu decided that I belong in its sphere, in its field of perception or sensitivity. I don't know how to call it in Western terms. But the fact is that I was sort of, I am seeing here in your studio, you have a sort of tornado image. And that's how it felt, like the Kipu grabbed me <laughs> <laughs> like that and enveloped me completely in its universe. And I began creating Kipus first in my poetry. I began speaking of my own body as the legs being hanging knots, you know. And this is in the 60s. And then in the 70s, I began creating these little sculptures that were kibbutz. And also in the year 1972, I created the first big kibbutz that was the size of my room. I did that in Concon, Chile. And so you move, you fast forward to 2022, when the date invites me to do the Turbine Hall. And People haven't heard of the Turbine Hall. I believe it's the largest uh, art space in Europe. I don't know if in the world, but at least in Europe. It's a huge uh, space. And they invite me to do a piece there. And I look up and I see a kipu. And I say, yes, I can do this. And I did actually two kipus. And I call them Brain Forest Kipu. Brain Forest Kipu. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I think the earth itself is like a brain forest, mm. composed of the mycelium of mushrooms and the web of life that unites all forests in the world. Because the forests of the world are creating the moist air that allows us to exist as human beings here. And as you well know, the violence against the forest of the world really began in Mesopotamia. And since then, Western culture, as it spread and colonized the planet, has keeps destroying all the forest, which is suicidal for humanity. Because, of course, the Earth will continue to exist, but probably without us. Because without the forest, it will be so dry and hot that human civilization will not really be possible. So I created this brain forest kipu for people to sense the pain of the forest, the skeletons of the dead trees, and the music of the people that is dying along with the forest, because all forests have forest peoples, and these peoples have created some of the most beautiful poetry and music of the world. And so you entered into this kipus at the Tate, and there was this amazing kipu of sound, of, you know, the most beautiful music that nobody ever hears, because just like people don't hear the languages of the people that are being exterminated by colonization, they also don't hear the music. And I could see young babies going directly into a trance mm -hmm. the minute they heard that. You know, I could see people of all races, all colors, old, invalid, uh, young, crazy, all the people that enter by the thousands into the Tate, falling into a different state of mind just in the presence of these skeletons of the dead trees. The Kipus from... Rainforest to brain forest. Yeah. You bring us through, you humanize it with a single letter. Yeah, because truly uh, our brain is so dependent on that moisture, you know. Our eyes could not see without it, their moisture. Our tongue could not speak without that saliva. You know, uh, one of my books is called Spit Temple. And it's the notion that 
all this moisture, this humidity, is the most sacred thing. And that's exactly what we're attacking. Spit Temple is a collection of your performances. Um, and it's like everything you do. But I, what are you a pole film artist? I don't even you know because... You're a poet, you're a filmmaker, you're a visual artist. Do you have, do you care how people, a multidisciplinary artist and so heavy and academic, do you, do you have a preference for what people should call what you do? Well, I think of myself as a poet because that's my primary occupation in this planet. And everything to me comes through poetry. And the fact that sometimes it becomes art is uh, like a consequence of poetry. And if it sometimes becomes a performance or a film, it's always a consequence of poetry. Because poetry, as you said in the beginning, is like air. Mm -hmm. It cannot exist without it. And if we acknowledge its existence, she takes us up. you know, And we become like... Um, like an old expression, her charges, you know, it's like, uh, that's how I feel, like, if you let go of all these notions that are imposed on us, like, you have a name, like, you're a person, like, you are this color or that color, if you let go of all that, you're just human, this humanness is completely poetical. Language is the essence of being human, and poetry is the essence of language. Yep. Here we are. I'm looking over at the art that you looked at. It's uh, got these marvelous cyclones that are drawn by Gene Heistein, and then it's got the um, the words as printed by Lawrence Wiener, this kind of quick poem it's, it's a poem like you could catch as catch can it says there um, that's what poetry does poetry sees someone passing and sees that this person is prone to cyclones and <laughs> grabs them up that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I feel <laughs> well what about con con well con con it's uh, it, it's uh, my parents you know my parents uh, had a love for this place so I started to visit this place in my mother's tummy when I di still didn't show up as a person. And so there are images of Cecilia, you know, in Spanish we say chapoteando, meaning your patitas, your little legs are <laughs> splashing in this <laughs> cold sea of the Southern Pacific. And I'm a baby of not even two years old and I am in Concon. So my family never lived all year round in Concon, but somehow the family always found itself in Concon. And it was in Concon that I suddenly felt like very much like that image of the cyclone. I felt the cold wind around my waist, being half naked as a teenage girl bathing in the sea. And I understood suddenly from the way that wind caressed me that the wind was sensing and feeling me the way I felt it. And that changed everything for me. That's the moment when I, I sort of, in Spanish we say, me desaparecí. I, I wasn't what I was before that to become like a leaf, like a piece of basurita, like a debris, like not even a grain of sand, but completely in awe of the beauty of this universe, you know, this wind, this light, this sea, this sun. And that's when my Arte Precario began. It's really an offering. It's a way of saying, I see that you see. And because we're seen, we're read, were perceived by the world around us. And this pretense that it is we who see and sense is what's killing everything, because it ain't that way. Mm. You know, 
people could say that uh, you made a movie of Kong Kong, but hearing you talk, I know that it was an offering to Kong Kong rather than a description of or, a, you know, that it was giving back. But it came in the form of a film. I wonder if that's a good enough segue to have you talk about poetry, film, and performance, and your yeah. film, Kong Kong. Yeah, I think um, it is, because um, why would that become a film? It was, um, I, by the time I did the film, which I started doing it, it was, I think, the year 2006 when I began filming Kong Kong. I had been doing my offerings in that beach since 66, so how many decades that was. And um, through those years, uh, the work that I did was completely invisible. It was visible to the sea. It was, in, it was visible to the earth. I knew that, and that was enough for me. But in the year 2006, I had met my partner, James O'Hearn, and when he heard me speak about this, and a few other friends, art historians, I started to see that the way I related to this place needed to be known by Chileans. And so it, it sort of, suddenly it sort of it happened of itself that um, this wonderful art historian, his name is Jose Norton Flicht, he said, let's go to Concon and we shall record uh, our conversations right there in the places where you have been doing your offerings for all these many decades. And that's how the film came about. And we were filming, visiting, revisiting those spots for four years. And I remember when was the premiere of the film, nobody wanted to see this film. So I talked to the Fisherman Union, and the Fisherman Union said, yes, the, you should show it here in the Fisherman, because the Fisherman appeared in the film, had supported me while I was doing it, in the sense that they were willing to be part of the film. But like a night before <laughs> the, the premiere, so-called, at the union of the Fisherman, the Fisherman said to me, we cannot do it anymore because the union has separated in two fighting groups. Oh. <laughs> and if you go with one group, the others will attack you. And so they say, but there's one union that still is united, which is the union of the oil workers. Because the Chilean government put a refinery, an oil refinery in the most sacred spot in Kong Kong, the ancient indigenous cemetery, going back 6,000 years of human occupation, boop, right there, the oil refinery. So it was in the oil refinery that I premiered the film. The audience was probably like 20 people, mothers, children, and the union workers. And I remember seeing these, you know, tough men crying uh, by the end of the film, and also the women. And they asked me, where is this Kong Kong? And they had lived in Kong Kong all their lives. Because that's how colonization operates. All the beauty and the deep dimension of knowledge of the people of this place is invisible, even to the inhabitants of Kong Kong. So that gave me the measure of how important to do a little film was. Because people can watch a film and they are not so open to hear a poet or a poem. So you get back at them by having the film be the poem. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in a way, as we move into digital consciousness, that's what we do. You know, I mean, the poets are always at the forefront of, of making the art, and now... If you have to write a poem with a camera, let's do it. Let's get there. And of course, it is true that the oral tradition can be carried through in digital in a, in a much more authentic way than it is when it's translated into, into books. Although 
With your books, you mm -hmm. add visual um, illuminations, so whether it's paintings or whether it's the text itself that changes. You know, your your circularity writing is is so extraordinary, but all this woven together creates a new kind of of art. You know, I'm I'm th I'm thinking now of Kurt Fitters who mm. thought that everybody should make up their own name, the name for whatever they did, that there was no such thing as art. There was only what everybody made and whatever. And he called his merits. Yes, like commerce. <laughs> exactly. That's supposedly the story. He yeah. was doing his tearing of the newspapers and there was commercial and he just tore the M-E-R-Z out of it and became the Mertz poet. Yeah, and, and it is very true. And, you know, I was a little girl, but my family was a very educated family and they had art books. And I remember seeing the Mertz bow probably when I was in my early 20s or late teens you know and i saw that and i uh, he was doing that in his own house and i had seen my grandmothers my aunts my cousins all of them worked in their bedrooms and so did i you know so it made so much sense to me and um, uh, by the time i saw his mirrors bow i had already converted my, my bedroom in art, but it was one thing to do it in your own bedroom and to see it in a book, you see. <laughs> so that sort of leaped uh, my imagination onto, hmm, so this is a fantastic way of existing. That's what he communicated yeah. to me, you know. A kind of validation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was it about that time that you sent your uh, poems off to uh, El Corno Emplomado? Yeah, I would say so. I was 18. I don't think I was yet 18 when I discovered, because I was a reader, I was always a reader. My father had a fantastic library. My grandfather published Vicente Huidobro, and he was also the, the lawyer of Pablo Neruda. Mm -hmm. So my family had, my grandfather was also friends with Gabriela Mistral. So he, poetry was part of the family life. And so uh, one day I discovered El Corno Plumado in a bookstore and I immediately thought it was the most wonderful magazine in the world. And I sent my poems and lo and behold, <laughs> they took them in. And suddenly my poetry, I was only 18 by the time these poems came up there. And you know, they would publish Allen Ginsberg, they would publish Thomas Merton. Uh, Ernesto Cardenal, Julio Cortázar, I mean, uh, amazing mm -hmm. poetry from all over the world, and suddenly Cecilia, that was my first publication of poetry. Wow, you know? and uh, got to mention another name here, Margaret Randall. Yes, she was the co-editor. Oh you know. my goodness! Tremendous lady, and Sergio Mondragon, her partner at the right, time. Right. So it was a meeting point of the universes, the universe that Margaret brought in the poetry, the beat poetry, and the universe that Sergio brought in. Exactly. Yeah, a meeting of languages, a meeting of poets of the universe, yep. and. Uh, El corno emplumado, which means uh, the feathered horn. I always thought of it as a bull's horn, but later on, uh, Margaret told me, "No, are you kidding me, Bob? It's a, it's a saxophone or yeah, a trumpet. It's, it's the it's, jazz. It's the, it's, the tr <laughs> it's the trumpet of the angels of William Blake. Oh, that's what it is." <laughs> She told me it was a jazz trumpet. It's she told true. Me. It's also a jazz trumpet. It's both. You see, so the angels are really William Blake angels too. You know. And the feathers come from Quetzalcoatl. Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. it's the Aztec Jazz Blake. Ah, <laughs> the Aztec Jazz Blake. And Margaret, hello to you out there in Albuquerque. Yeah, We're so I glad. really admire Margaret immensely. True hero. And um, they, yeah, can you imagine the mind that Margaret and Sergio had to put in a magazine a little girl like me along with this poets and they did that all the time not just with me with other people and we created a sort of community of friendship that is still alive today 
you know for example when i arrive when i arrive when i arrive in london uh, it was in the year 72 suddenly through this network of poetry felipe Ehrenberg, who had been part of el corno heard that cecilia was in london and he immediately invited me to come uh, publish a book with him and that's how i published my first book it was in London, because getting back to the censorship in Chile, mm-hmm. uh, I had signed a contract of my poetry in Chile in the year 71 before I left, and that book was never published. Because even after signing a contract, the poems themselves fell into the hands of high powered people in that university, which was the Catholic University of Chile. And they prevented the publication, and so it they were censored. And what, what was, as I as I remember, it wasn't necessarily political censorship. It was. It was the censorship of a young woman, young erotic. Woman. There it is. Poetry. Yeah, yeah. Because erotic yes, poetry written by women is more dangerous than any political. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. You yes. Know? And yeah. they succeeded in preventing that poetry from circulating in Chile for like four decades. You know? Crazy, crazy, crazy. But you went on to do political work while you were in London there in the early 70s. No, I actually began doing political began. work in Chile. Uh-huh. Because, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, uh, I was part of the the student movement sure. that went for Salvador Allende. Yeah, excuse me, I thought I, 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 I meant that you continued your political work. In, yeah, it in changed London. meaning, of course, because when I was a teenager, um, the great movement that took Salvador Allende to the presidency, we kids in the high schools also participated. And we rallied along with the miners and with the peasants and with the workers. It was like a different world. The, the Chile before the coup. And so I, for example, my first exhibition was an homage to the construction of socialism. And that was in 1971 in Santiago at the National Museum of Fine Arts. And my homage consisted in filling one room with autumn leaves. And how could that be political, everybody asked. And I said, well, because the leaves are dying. And if you're aware of your death, you have to fight for revolution because you're going to die so soon. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? So you have to fight for joy. And the only way to fight for joy is revolution. That was my logic as a young girl. I still believe in that logic, you know. Mm. The only way to fight for joy is revolution. I'm just going to Im- tattoo that on my... Uh, on my hand right now, so I'll never and the the, uh, the actual revolution of Allende was joyful. Mm. You know, we danced in the street. I remember there were rallies at the time. Santiago was a small city of three million people. There were rallies when there was one million people dancing wow. for joy in the streets. You know, and so how did that beauty? bring about the horror of Nixon and Kissinger thinking we have to stop that freedom, we have to stop that joy, you know, and they did, and... Yeah, I was, uh, I was in Nicaragua with the Sandinistas with Ernesto Cardinal, I was on a trip with, uh, with Allen Ginsberg, and Ernesto came out to the tarmac, up onto the airplane, and it really did feel like utopia there with all the poetry workshops going on and people had this dancing, joyful spirit. Um, so you felt it, you were part of that. Listen, I felt it also in Eritrea in the year 2000. Yes. I've been very lucky to feel it twice, but in both cases, as in Chile, I mean, it doesn't last long. Yeah. You know, that's. It's, a, it's, it's not allowed because the combination of patriarchy and capital you know, it has been deadly for the planet. And it's not allowed because that is the true language of freedom, is the, the right to be ourselves. 
and that is what is not allowed you know and so it's a terrible thing because the language of freedom has been kidnapped by the ultra right around the world and this language of lies and this language of disguised hatred and that is what rules the waves you know and uh, when i wonder are people going to begin to turn away from that language of hatred and you know discrimination wonder when wonder when um well, certainly going to see your exhibition at the Guggenheim, which was called Spin, Spin, Trianguline, um, was a moment of liberation and joy. Yes, and it's again like this cyclone, spin, spin, because um, spinning is the property of the cosmos, you know, and it's also the property of emergence meaning how unexpected change occurs and it is through this unexpected change that i believe we still have a chance to turn around the destruction and it is through spinning through not spinning as it is used in the u.s like spinning a false tail mm -hmm. but to put a spin on something exactly yeah. but it is through allowing the, our blood to speak. That's a Maya concept. You know? Let the blood speak. I also see it, um, Cecilia, as a spinning thread to come up with uh, that red thread that you use to, in, to weave together an audience or the thread that you use uh, to have knots in it that, that have the meanings that we take alphabets to figure out in your in your kippah yeah. yeah and it's weaving together you know is is to connect to connect with our deep selves to connect with the living spirit of what we now call nature what a bad name because what is not nature <laughs> you see mm. everything is nature but truly everything that lives and even minerals bacteria virus the whole bit is miraculous you know and so for me it is the act of of total love is mm. the awakening you know and poets have been saying this all along it is not our generation but it is certainly the one line the one thread that unites all forms of poetry What would you think about uh, trying a little performance right here, right now? <laughs> what would you like to do? Would you like to, to do the, what you thought of? I would like to do what I thought of, yes. Okay. Precario. Where is it? Let me. Um, I found it. Precario, which, okay. um, of course, is precarious, but also in its root meaning, it goes back, I didn't know this to prayer mm -hmm. um, crazy to think of those two words how they are related yeah I call it precario arte precario thinking that precario meant fragile because it disappears mm -hmm. and I oh, thought yeah. that is our condition as humans we are here for a very short time and we will disappear that is what makes us beautiful that is what makes life majestic, the fact that it's only for a short time. And that was why I called it precario. And then, like 20 years later, I encountered the Latin. And the Latin says that, that precarius means obtained by prayer. And I thought, what a wonderful thing to think that our precarity, the fact that you are, we are so fragile, is our way of praying. And prayer itself is so fragile. What is not fragile is the fact that this mystery goes on. You know, and even if we don't succeed in surviving as humanity, 
other creatures will go on. Bacteria will continue to colonize. And from that colonization, who knows what kind of life will come. And it's all precarious. Okay. So I will say one line and you will say the next. I, I always love having a director. Yes. Y si yo dedicara mi vida and if I devoted my life a una de sus plumas to one of its feathers a vivir su naturaleza to living its nature ser la y comprenderla being it, understanding it hasta el fin until the end y llegar a una época reaching a time en que mis gestos in which my acts son las mil varillas ínfimas de la pluma y mi silencio los sumidos Susurro el viento en la pluma y mi pensamiento veloz ajustados y certeros como no pensamientos de la pluma. The non thoughts of the feather. La pluma. Thanks go out to our dear friend and wonderful guest today here at Poetry is Bread, Cecilia Vicuña. You know, folks, if you, if you each got to make up your own art, would you please get busy and make up Cecilia Vicuña? I'm Bob Holman, and thank you for listening to Poetry is Bread. Subscribe to our podcast to get notifications of new episodes, or check us out at BoweryPoetry.com. Podcast is co-produced by Ram Devanini and <laughs> Flavia Roja with Rataplax. Artwork by Fabian Ceruleo. The podcast series is funded by National Endowment for the Arts and New York State Council on the Arts, Governor of New York State and the New York State Legislature. Cecilia, do you have a last word or anything for us here? Yo, <laughs> 